heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. Live from San Francisco, this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, full market coverage, a stock stage, a Tuesday turnaround after $6.5 trillion was wiped from Global Markets Monday. Plus, we sit down with the CTO of Palantir as AI demand boosts the company's outlook. And the US rules Google illegally monopolized the search market through exclusive deals. It's a bit of a sigh of relief on Tuesday. Call it a dead cat bounce, talk, call it a turnaround. This is what financial markets look like. Notable gains on the Nasdaq 100 chip stocks recovering after it was technology that led the selling in equity markets on Monday. A lot of volatility around growth concerns and also economic data. And then Bitcoin is interesting as well. You saw at 56,000 US dollars per token. Later in the show, we'll go deeper on that. Let's move over to the single names because earnings are a big part of the story in the moment. There are two in particular that we're looking at. Uh, I really want to focus on Uber, up almost 8%. Strong gross booking, strong on the bottom line. We're going to get to our report on that in just a moment. And then coming up, the CTO of Palantir. Updated outlook for revenue, updated outlook for profit, AI demand from both commercial and government customers. That's going to be a really interesting conversation in the next segment. Stay tuned for it. We'll go back to markets. Joining us for more is David Bunsen, Chief Investment Officer at the Bunsen Group, which oversees $5.7 billion in assets under management. The story Monday was about some of the mega cap tech names, some of those that have fueled the gains in the first half of the year. Some of those names you were particularly concerned about, so you sat on the sidelines away from them. How do you react to the last 24 hours then? Well, it's interesting that with that sector, it wasn't really a Monday story per se. It had started July 10th. Uh, the Nasdaq's drawdown had reached 13.5% yesterday, so there was already quite a bit of slide going on, and I think that does stem from the overvaluation. It's pretty stunning when you see a name like NVIDIA that had been down 25 to 30 percent and was still trading at about 59 times earnings, 30 times sales after such a violent correction. Um, I think even today when you look at Apple still being negative with this kind of uh, bounce back rally today, it does feel to me like a rotation of leadership is very well underway. You, you raise a point that we reiterated in, in yesterday's show that Friday marked four straight weekly declines on the Nasdaq 100, right? You were already in correction territory. I guess a question for someone like you, David, is what do you do now? You know, is the drawdown or, or so-called technical correction enough that you start to look at some of the names that for many, they are uh, Tina's or they are, there is no alternative to holding them? Well, there are probably investor categories that might want to look at something there. Not, they should, certainly shouldn't be doing it because they believe it's reached a value. Uh, these are still extremely expensive stocks. For us as dividend growth investors, the tiny little paltry dividend that the NVIDIA's, Meta's, and Apple's pay is not enough to wet our beak. And, and, and so they would have a long way to go to start returning cash to shareholders for us to be attracted. But even apart from our dividend growth orientation, the valuations are still very high. Um, I, I began professionally managing money in the 1990s, and so I will be forever scarred by the reality of what happens when you overpay for very good companies very big and successful companies that have a generational success, and yet their stock goes nowhere for 10, mm. 15, 20 years. And Cisco's case still hasn't got back to 1999 levels. Those stories are real, and I believe very much they will be the case with some of these names, too. I think investors have to be careful. I, I find names like Cisco, maybe even Adele, interesting as sort of appendages to the infrastructure build out that's happening. I wrote about it in today's Tech Daily, right? If you think about the growth concern, investment or capital expenditures into data center seem to be plowing ahead regardless of, of short-term jitters. Is there an opportunity for you in that space, David? Um, or do you think it's, it's just overdone already at this point? 
Well, and that's a very interesting story because there you can get cash flow. And so, for example, Blackstone has become one of the largest investors institutionally in the data center story, and we're able to get a real yield and become a landlord, so to speak, to data center, become a little bit yes. less concerned with the, with the underlying business fundamentals as to how much Microsoft's going to buy from NVIDIA or what the monetization of AI is going to be. A lot of those questions are not answered. They're not going to get answered anytime soon. Soon, but data center becomes a story that from a brick and mortar standpoint you can make money in. Uh, I find that so interesting. Never before did I think I'd be writing about REITs in my technology yeah. newsletter and I use their forecasts or data to kind of look at the market pipeline as a whole. Earnings. Um, you know, this morning we wake up Palantir strength, Uber strength. Um, last week we learned from Microsoft in particular that if you miss estimates, uh, you're in trouble. But there's still a long way to run in this earnings period. Have you taken a sort of lesson on the whole from the, those that have already reported? Yeah, we're about 75% of the way through. It does appear that overall earnings growth uh, is not going to be 8% as targeted on the quarter, but probably closer to 5%. Uh, year over year, earnings growth still looks like it'll be about 12%, but some base effects are going to make that a lot harder in the next quarters. And so I think the story of Microsoft is a kind of a microcosm of the underlying reality that there's this sort of feedback loop at play that Microsoft goes up because it's buying a lot from NVIDIA and NVIDIA goes up because Microsoft's buying a lot from it. And, and of course, there's a lot of other customers. But this idea that AI doesn't ever have to tell you how it's going to make money for real other than an infrastructure backbone story um, is problematic. And if those revenues are going to be okay. going down before they've converted to profits, then you have an unwind that has to take place of a feedback loop. David, for the technology sector then, what happens in the second half of this year? Um, I would be somewhat unconstructive on the space on a valuation basis, but we are hardly the, uh, the types of technology investors that, that you normally would be speaking to, just in the sense of our boring insistence on free cash flow. Um, you know, we own Broadcom in the portfolio. We don't believe it got to the valuation overstretch that NVIDIA has. And then we own old tech names like IBM and Cisco that have ongoing free cash flow from old line businesses businesses, but obviously new growth opportunities. That's the way we would prefer to play it, just simply because we think perfection was priced in to the more contemporary technology names. David, I do not for a second think you are boring. David Bunsen, CEO at the Bunsen Group. It's been great to talk to you. Thank you very much. Let's get back to the earnings story. We spoke about Uber reporting results before the opening bell this morning. I want to bring in Bloomberg's Natalie Lung, who covers the gig economy platforms for us, and, and just go straight to gross bookings. It's basically everything that runs through the Uber platform apart from the tips. But within that, there are loads of stories. What did you learn about Uber, Natalie? Yes, so from gross brokings, it includes ride share and delivery and user frequency and as well as driver activity on the platform is all time high. And this result is really showing how Uber's strategy of pushing into new areas, new use cases are playing out really well for them. And for example, they launch um, affordable options such as shuttles and lower cost shared rides. And that's sort of contributing to the counter cyclical story that um, the CEO talked about on their call and helping them sort of be um, weather their sort of uh, consumer downturn. Bloomberg's Nasty Lung all across Uber, and there's a lot more to come in that space, of course. DoorDash, Uber, and then we get Lyft, and that will give us a bigger picture of the strength in that market. Coming up on this program, we're joined by Shyam Sankar, CTO of Palantir, discussing the company's earnings released after the closing bell Monday, one of the big movers to the upside this morning. Commercial customers, military customers, government customers. That's the conversation. This is Bloomberg Technology.
Let's keep it going with earnings coverage. Palantir out with results, boosting its revenue guidance for the year to a range of 2.74 billion to 2.75 billion ahead of estimates. With AI demand also helping Palantir boost its profit outlook. There's been growth in business with government and in commercial customers. AIP, Palantir's artificial intelligence platform, and other products has quote transformed the business in little more than a year. CTO Sean Sanka joins us to discuss. Um, Sean, on the call, this transformation that Dr. Cart was talking about, I, I've been to a few AIP cons, but as CTO, you're working on it. I think just explain the basics of that. What's changed within Palantir from a technology perspective and in the, the domain of artificial intelligence? Well, what you really see in the market is this massive bottleneck between prototyping and production. And that happens to be where AIP is most differentiated. And that differentiation is built on a decade of deep technical investments, investments like the ontology, the OSDK, the security and business primitives that we built throughout the platforms like functions, actions, automations, and this pipeline that we have that's really focused on addressing that. And I think what's changed as, you, as, you, as you've been to these AIP cons is that the market now understands how severe that bottleneck is. I think your last guest was just talking about that, where uh, it's so easy to build a charismatic AI prototype. It's about the amount of effort of building a PowerPoint slide, but it's also that amount of utility. Uh, and unlike traditional deterministic software, this kind of powerful stochastic genie that is LLMs, it requires a lot more work to get to production, maybe 10 to 100 times as much work. And that requires the tool chain that we've assembled with AIP. I've, uh, I've had a few conversations with your CEO, Alex Carp, about his frustration with the PowerPoint deck versus the reality of shipping product. We'll, we'll put that to one side for now, Sean. Uh, there was a heavy emphasis on working with the military in, in the written materials and on the call. Could you just give the basics of what your work with the military looks like present day? Look, in the commercial world, you call it a value chain, from the hand of your supplier to the hand of your customer. In the military, it's about a kill chain, from sensor to shooter. But really, at the most abstract level, it's the same thing. We're trying to enable our warfighters to have information dominance and decision advantage. How can I see, you know, to quote Sun Tzu, if you, if you know your enemy and you know yourself, you're going to win. And so, you know, how can I see everything there is to know about the threat? How can I understand everything I have to combat and deter any aggression from those threats? And when you look at the geopolitical landscape right now, it could not be more dangerous. Everything that's going on in Eastern Europe, the massive tensions that, are, that exist in, in the Middle East, and the, the ongoing issues that we have in deterring aggression in the Pacific. Beyond sort of the importance of data, where does Palantir sit in the defense ecosystem or even the defense supply chain? Are you sort of very closely aligned with hardware makers, the aerospace community, or is, it, is the model more focused on you just going direct to different arms of, of the defense base with government? Yeah, we're, we're touching all of it. One of the things I'm most excited about, I've been calling the first breakfast as an antidote to the 1993 Last Supper that led to the consolidation of our defense industrial base, where we went from 51 primes down to five. Because we forget that at the dawn of World War II, we didn't have a defense industrial base, we had an American industrial base. Chrysler made missiles, General Mills, the serial company, made inertial guidance systems. And so we have this moment right now in defense tech where $100 billion or more of capital has been deployed. A bolus of founders have shown up. There's a lot of creativity, a lot of energy. As a company that's, that's kind of been pathfinding over 20 years, not only have we developed our software that gives these warfighters unique advantage, like the Maven contract that CDAO just recently awarded for nearly half a billion dollars, but really this software infrastructure that's required to deliver modern American software to the battlefield in air-gapped environments at speed, at pace, well ahead of the threats of 2027. So we've been working very closely with both traditional primes, integrating our software into their hardware, helping them actually with production. If you think about the 50% of our business that's commercial oriented, how do we build jet engines and satellites faster, better, cheaper? Um, in addition to the new entrants who need to achieve scale and time, value of money is everything for them. Whenever we have a, 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 an executive on this program, I always go to our audience uh, and say, you know, what is it that you want to know from, in this case, Palantir? I would say most of the questions were about warp speed. Uh, very basic ones. Why now with warp speed? And, and the obstacles to rolling it out, making it sort of more uh, readily available, per pervasive out there, Sean. 
Yeah, that, that's great. I, I'm so excited about Warp Speed. It's what I'm spending all of my time on and really shaping the R&D roadmap around. Uh, Warp Speed is our modern American operating system for manufacturing. And the reason why now, you know, for the better part of 20 years, we have helped traditional manufacturers build planes, trains, automobiles, and ships. Uh, but most of those folks are stuck in a legacy mode of how they're operating, and you're able to help here or there. But what's unique about the reindustrialization movement that's happening right now in America is that these, these founders, they're alumni of Palantir, of Tesla, of SpaceX, and they understand that the traditional ERP, PL, PLM, PLC software doesn't really work, that most of these successful companies have had to build their own software, and that is really an unaffordable journey. So that there's this massive opportunity to take the power of AIP and the historical experiences we have throughout the value chain of production to help our customers bend their atoms better with bits. Uh, Shom, I have your CTO, I kind of have some quick fire questions that I've never been able to answer about Palantir. In the first instance, AIP and, and warp speed, over the year, what's the kind of key foundational model or LLM that you've been building on top of? I know you partner as well as sort of think in-house about um, the model or foundation level, but that's a question that comes up quite a lot. Who are you building on top of and working with? Well, I think all the value is really going to create at the application layer. And what we've seen in production is that you actually need a menagerie of models. And, you you know, if you think about the most expensive frontier model out there right now, it's a thousand times more expensive than the cheapest open source model for 10 percent more ELO. 10% more IQ as a rough proxy. That's not a compelling price performance trade-off. You already see that the first versions of GPT-4 have been sunset. You know, we, we need to think about this problem as, okay, what is the infrastructure I need to make? I'm turning my software into something that is now stochastic. It's not deterministic anymore. Computer scientists that we have trained, they are all used to writing deterministic code. You know, this is this harkens more to how we think about the transition from analog circuits to digital circuits, the sort of error correction you need, the sort of infrastructure you need to think about having so that you can have the abstraction to think about these things as being digital. That's where I think so the dollar is going to be. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, and so we're, we're very focused on helping our customers get the right models for the right use cases, auto-evaluate that, auto automatically generate um, iterations on the prompts that get them there. And part of our theory is that really prompts are for developers. Chat is a dead end. We're, we're guiding our customers through this journey here. They get there pretty quickly to realize that we should be thinking of LLMs as a new type of runtime. The way I might write a Python function, well, okay. I'm going to write an LLM function too. Uh, Sean, for the commercial half of the business, is there a specific hyperscale cloud platform or partner that you work with to support its growth? Uh, we're working with all of them. We have, we have deep and very valuable relationships there. Uh, so we're, we're very happy with that. This last year has been about AIP and growth. What's the next 12 months like for Palantir, Sean? Well, I think it's really about deepening the investments that we have with AIP that are addressing this bottleneck between prototyping and production. You know, if you if you look at David Kahn at Sequoia's article on the six hundred billion dollar hole in revenue, I think this is where the hole is. This is the bottleneck in the market. It's the most important problem to solve. And the folks who solve it first, and I think we're in the pole position there, have the opportunity to take the entire market. Sham Sankar, CTO of Palantir, it's great to have you back on Bloomberg Technology. Thank you so much. In other tech news, Google lost in a historic antitrust suit after the tech giant had paid $26 billion to become the default search engine on smartphone web browsers. I want to bring in Bloomberg's Leah Nyland, who's been reporting with the team on this case. Let, let's start with the basics, the decision and how it will impact Alphabet or, or Google, Alphabet, the parent of Google. Yeah, so the decision that came out yesterday is actually just the one on whether Google violated the law. So um, the judge found that Google has an illegal monopoly over two markets, the general search services market, which is what consumers use to find things on the web, and search text ads, which are the ones that are at the top of the page that sort of try and lure you to websites. Um, and so this was just, as I said, on the liability. Now we're going to go to sort of the next phase of the case, which is where we're going to talk about what to do about this. Um, 
Um, and the Justice Department hasn't necessarily said what they want yet, but there's sort of uh, several options that people think, one of which is a potential breakup. So um, they could ask for the court to make Google sell off um, the Chrome browser or the Android operating system, both of which were um, key things in the trial. Or uh, the judge could go with maybe like a, a slightly lesser um, penalty or remedy, which uh, such as making Google share some of the data that it collects um, that sort of underlies all of its search results with other search engines like Bing or search startups. You kind of answered the what happens next, but a lot of questions I got on social media was, does the ruling have teeth, if you see what I mean? You know, there are some opinion pieces out there about this being kind of a hollow victory for regulators. And the stock's kind of flat. It, it's hard to gauge how serious this is, I guess, guess what I'm saying about Alphabet. But it, but it is important, right? Yeah, it's probably not going to take any impact immediately. Google has said it's going to appeal. Those sorts of appeals generally take a year to 18 months. So, of course, this is going to delay any actual changes to Google's search engine or its business. But what the decision means is that long term, like Google is definitely going to have to change its practices. It's not going to remain the um, sort of dominant search engine um, for very long. And uh, it may end up having to hive off, as I said, certain parts of its business which have provided you know a, a nice cushion to the company um, the one thing that you did see sort of yesterday was there was a, a pretty sharp stock sell for Apple because 20 billion dollars of that 26 billion dollars that you mentioned had been going to Apple every year um, it simply you know had this contract with Google it got 20 billion dollars pretty much for not doing anything except letting them be the default on the iPhone and uh, this ruling definitely puts that in danger because the the judge said you can't have have this exclusive agreement like that when you're this dominant. You have to let other people compete. So it might end up changing some aspects of the iPhone. There are a lot of questions about, you know, right now Apple is creating very similar agreements with Google and OpenAI over uh, AI um, chatbots and such that could be on the iPhone. Will it have to make some changes to those agreements because of this decision? That's possible. And we reiterate, Leah, that, of course, Google has said it plans to appeal the decision. Anyway, Bloomberg's near Nyland. Thank you. It's official. Vice President Kamala Harris tapped Minnesota Governor Tim Waltz as her running mate. This in an effort to build an electoral coalition of coastal progressives and Midwest moderates to block Donald Trump from returning to the White House. Let's get out to D.C. and Bloomberg's Kaylee Lyons. I have to be honest, I didn't know as much about Tim Waltz before this morning or indeed the work <laughs> done in, in the state of Minnesota. But that's the logic we've just outlined for the appointment. What else do we know? Yeah, and it is worth noting that he probably doesn't have the same name recognition as others we understood to be on the shortlist for vice presidential contention. Nonetheless, he is a very popular governor in his state of Minnesota. So he's someone with executive experience. He also served 12 years in the House of Representatives. Before that, he was a high school teacher, a coach. He served in the U.S. military, and he's from rural Nebraska. So while he doesn't actually represent a swing state, Minnesota has been safely blue since 1972 when it went for Richard Nixon. The last time it went for a Republican, he does have proximity and therefore perhaps accessibility to those Rust Belt voters in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, the states that make up that critical blue wall. This is also someone that we know has been favored by labor. The UAW president, Sean Fain, has spoken highly uh, of him. The AFL-CIO just endorsed him uh, today in the aftermath of Harris's announcement. He was well known and liked uh, among Gen Z young people. He, of course, has gone quite viral on social media in recent weeks, being the first one to coin uh, J.D. Vance and Donald Donald Trump, the Republican ticket, as being weird, something the Harris weird. campaign has seized on. And of course, he also uh, has enjoyed Democratic control of the state legislator, late legislature in Minnesota in his second term as governor, which has allowed him to enact a more progressive agenda, uh, agenda codifying abortion rights, paid family leave, lunches uh, for young children in schools, that kind of thing that has uh, won him a lot of praise with the left. I would just note that as the exact reason why you're already seeing Republicans out criticizing him today. The Trump campaign casting him as dangerously liberal and a radical leftist today, Ed. 
Uh, I would note that some of the reaction I saw on social media was exactly the reaction to the weird memes that circulated after he gave that interview, particularly among the venture capital and tech community, which we'll get to in a second. This played out on social media in part, the official confirmation, but I believe that you know we're likely to hear from Vice President Harris, and I guess some more about her rationale. Could you just walk our audience through, now that the ticket's established, what happens next? Yeah, well, of course, Harris has confirmed this on her uh, campaign X account. We do expect there will be some kind of video that rolls out also on sh social media at some point today. And then she will be appearing alongside Governor Walsh at a rally in Philadelphia this evening. That is going to kick off a multi-swing state tour that the two will embark on over the next five days. They're going to be, for example, in Detroit tomorrow, rallying with the United Auto Workers uh, in part. And so they'll be visiting a number of these battleground streets. Of course, we were told not to read into the fact that their event today is in Philadelphia. Philadelphia, the hometown uh, of Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro, who was not in fact selected. So perhaps not reading into that was the right thing to do. We, of course, have heard from Governor Shapiro today saying that he intends to work uh, to get Harris support in Pennsylvania and defeat Donald Trump. But it also plays into this notion, the idea that he was not selected. You're seeing some Republicans, including the vice presidential nominee on the Republican ticket, J.D. Vance, casting the decision not to choose Shap Shapiro as anti-Semitic, given that he is a Jewish man and had been more pro-Israel and had received a lot of backlash among progressives for his handling of pro-Palestinian protests earlier this year. So that, the idea that Labor didn't like him uh, as much, may have played a role in Harris's decision not to choose Shapiro. So I'm not sure if we will see him on stage alongside Harris and, and Walls tonight, but that is the next time. And the first time, really, you will see this ticket together in person now that the announcement has been made, with, of course, less than two weeks to go until the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. Bloomberg's Kaylee Lyons, thank you very much. I want to bring in Shruti Shah, who's a partner at Symphonic Capital and one of the signatories of VCs for Kamala, a list of more than 200 venture capitalists that have publicly backed Kamala Harris and her White House bid. And Shruti Shah joins us from Durham in the swing state of North Carolina. Uh, let's just start with, with the ticket. Your reaction to uh, Vice President Harris selecting Governor Waltz as, as her running mate. Yeah. Um, well, thanks for having me, Ed. And um, I am excited that we finally have a vice presidential choice on the ticket. Um, I think Governor Walsh is an excellent choice for Vice President Harris, and um, I'm excited to see what the two of them are going to be able to do together. Um, I think as far as it as far as it relates to tech, we're still learning more about um, Vice President or about Governor Waltz's policies um, with regard to tech. But I think that he's done a lot in the state of Minnesota. Um, just uh, Minnesota has been declared a tech hub by the Biden Harris administration. In addition to that, um, he's also done a lot to expand rural broadband access. Shruti. The week that followed the assassination attempt on former President Trump and then the selection of J.D. Vance as his running mate, we had many venture capitalists on this program and those from, let's call it Silicon Valley more broadly, who came out in support. They basically said, we see J.D. Vance as being um, a good voice for entrepreneurs and somebody with experience in our industry. Are you able to make the same arguments for the, for the Harris-Waltz ticket at this stage? How do you think they will approach your world directly? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And I just want to start by saying that I don't think many of the venture capitalists who came out in support of Trump are representative of the entire industry. As we know, uh, Kamala Harris is from Silicon Valley. She grew up in Oakland, and she's been a longtime supporter of the tech industry. Um, and she shares a lot of values that uh, many of us in the tech industry have, particularly with regard to immigration and ensuring that we are continuing to drive innovation in this country with policies that are favorable to tech. Um, so I really believe strongly that um, we should be thinking more broadly about um, the ways in which um, the tech industry has more diverse viewpoints than the ones that I think some um, very vocal members of the industry uh, espouse. True, so we're showing um, some of the, the leading names, I suppose, who are signatories to the VCs for Kamala. What is the one biggest factor that unites you in your support of Harris? Or I guess the opposite, the biggest factor that, that makes you concerned about a Trump presidency? I mean, I think one of the biggest things that worries me about a Trump presidency is just Trump's past history with immigration policies. If you look at 
the number of unicorns in this country that have been started by immigrants. I believe it's around half of all of the unicorns in the United States have been started by immigrant founders. Um, about 80 percent of them have immigrants in leadership roles. Um, the H-1B policy, visa policy is really critical for the tech industry, and um, Trump does not have a positive track record there. So I think having a president who understands the importance of immigration in this country is really critical. Shruti Shah, partner at Symphonic Capital, uh, thank you for joining us here on Bloomberg Technology. Again, one of the signatories to VCs for Kamala. Now, coming up on the show, we're going to take a look at OpenAI as the company's co-founder, Greg Brockman, and John Shulman take a step back from their roles, marking a shift in company management. An important story coming up next. This is Bloomberg Technology. OpenAI is undergoing a shift, another one, as both co-founders step back from leading the company. Greg Brockman, who's president of OpenAI, is going on sabbatical until the end of the year, while John Shulman is leaving the company to join rival AI startup Anthropic. I want to bring in Bloomberg's Rachel Metz. This was big news yesterday evening. Um, I think the important starting point is Greg Brockman is important, Rachel. He's going on a leave of absence. Sort of define what we know about that. Yeah, so we know that he informed the company that he's going to be taking off until the end of the year. Um, he's been at the company from the very beginning. In fact, I've been told by people that the very earliest days of OpenAI were happening at his apartment. Um, so he's definitely been an integral piece of the company. He's one of the top people there, um, someone that Sam Altman, the CEO, often looks to. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see what happens while he's out. We're showing a post that he did on X kind of confirming the, the details details of it and he, it looks like he needs a break. Uh, Shulman is a name I, I'm less familiar with. What was he doing at OpenAI and, and, and I guess how significant is it that he's jumping over to Anthropic of all places? That I would say that's a pretty big deal. I mean we've seen a couple people make that kind of move um, recently from OpenAI but yeah John Shulman also someone who's been there from the very beginning with him gone and with Greg on leave that means there are, to my count is like two people from the original 2015 blog post saying, welcome, this is OpenAI, here are all of our founding members. Yes. We have Sam Altman, we have Waj Zaremba. Um, I believe those are the two people that are remaining there um, in, uh, in addition to these guys. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens going forward. So, I mean, the, the information reported in the first instance that Greg Brockman was leaving. Then I think we got some clarification that it's, it's, it's a leave of absence or a sabbatical. But the point being, in aggregate, people track open AI. There's been a lot of change. It seems a very long time ago that Sam Altman was briefly ousted. So, so summarize it all up for, for the audience. You know, where do they stand now versus that fateful weekend of November 23? Yeah, yeah. No, it, was <laughs> it seems so long ago, but also not. So a lot of leadership has changed and left, and a lot of things have been reorganized there, especially in the safety portion of the company. Um, Sam, obviously, is back from that time in November. Um, Ilya Siskiver, um, who helped organize the coup to remove Sam in the first place and then recanted, um, has left the company. Um, Jan Leakey, who had worked on super alignment at the company, um, is gone. Um, and we also have um, a bunch of other people in leadership positions, such as John Schulman, um, that have left. And now we also have, as, as we said, Greg Brockman has, uh, is stepping, stepping back. I mean, to be fair, he's been there for a long time. He's done a lot of work. So maybe he just wants a break. For a lot of people, th that's not so import important, particularly if you're, you're, you're in the world of engineering. You want to say, what's OpenAI shipping right now? What is the latest thing for them on the product side? Um, well, that's that's an excellent question, actually. So they have um, thank you the very <laughs> you're welcome. They have all the the models that are in ChatGPT, um, and including um, GPT 4.0, which was released in the past couple months. Um, but the most recent thing is voice mode, which is in alpha, which means it's been released to a very limited number of people. The company has not said how many people. Um, but it's not that many people, from what I can tell. And they're slowly going to be releasing it to more people in the coming weeks and months through the fall. 
I actually asked them if I could get my hands on it, so to speak. Let's see what happens. Bloomberg's Rachel Metz, thank you. An important piece of reporting. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Uh, we're two days into a week that has felt like an entire week. Recap everything on the podcast. You know exactly where to find it. All the Bloomberg platforms, including the Bloomberg Terminal, Apple, Spotify, iHeart, and elsewhere. Uh, from San Francisco, just me this week, this is Bloomberg Technology. Bloomberg Technology.